either or. Okay. We'll do it this way. Uh, I'm wondering whether addiction is treated now at, or, or whether that's a class now at the medical school. And, and if, you know, you, you mentioned Judge Stoner that there was no such class and I, there still is no such class at the law school in addiction. So I'm wondering what some of the possibilities you all perceive might be that exist to have something cross-listed uh, between the medical school and the law school or other schools as well. Dr. Ostermeyer also, also might want to love the idea. And uh, here at OU, we opened up the CARES Clinic at the Steve, and we have Dr. Tipper Lee Bartell, who is the lead and um, we would love to get engaged and uh, team up. I think, it, you know, in my view, um, these diversion courts, because they are so effective, they are kind of our, I think, our course of the future in terms of where the results you get from it. So, Anybody that is in a law school that's interested in practicing criminal law, I don't think you will be fluent in criminal law, be competent in criminal law, that you have a working knowledge of at least how diversion courts work, uh, you know, the, and why they work, and really understand that six inches between your ears, I guess it all comes down to that. But the most important. Judge Burton? Well, when I was in the DA's office, we would switch our interns, law clerks, um, every every six months so one semester another semester in the summer and so that they could be in different areas in the da's office and i required the interns to do time with treatment courts because it's just not you know when you graduate law school and you want to be a trial lawyer and you want to kick ass and you you know you want to just show how great you are you you don't have the mindset of the treatment and helping people and so I found that the most well-rounded kids that got through law school, because they're kids to me now, um, that, I mean, if they did some time in our treatment courts, they realized, oh my gosh, they would come back and say, oh my gosh, there's people that really need this. And it's true. Um, so lawyers need to learn that in law school. Um, it should be a part of an internship that you spend a month or two with with a treatment court because it's going to make them a better person and a better lawyer and whatever medical schools can do to come down. And I mean, we would love to have you at ours. Uh, I think we had another question up here. Commissioner Holter, I'm talking. There we go. Hey, so I'm Dave O'Brien. I work for the FAA and we take care of pilots sometimes who have substance abuse issues. I loved your conversation about providing incentives and disincentives. And of course, in the FAA, incentive to pilots to get sober because they can't fly. And that's what they love in not flying is almost as bad as going to prison. Um, we find that using um, support groups like AA and A and uh, sober recovery are very helpful. Do you incorporate that into the uh, diversion programs as well? Yeah, very much. C community is critical. Uh, I always tell people, you know, you're the only one that can do this, but you don't have to do it alone. As a matter of fact, you can't do it alone. You have to do it to help other people. So, uh, you know, humans, we're social creatures, and we're actually social learners. And so that means we prefer to learn from people who are like ourselves. So it's one thing to learn from a judge telling, hey, this is what you ought to be doing. Or even have a therapist telling what you're doing. The most effective people in our program are what we call peer support. I mean, I've got people who be the graduate graduate program or people that are in long-term recovery themselves, but they've been there. And so it's it's almost like when I when I want my kids to do something, I have teenage boys, if I tell them they don't listen to me. But if I want them to do something, I can call their uncle and their cool uncle Dan says you should do this. Like they'll listen to him. So if I want something to be, I mean, I mean, it sounds weird. I'm the judge say, hey, this is what you gotta be doing. But that, if I really want to do it, I can call Pierce Moore, hey Shannon, you should go talk to Andrew because he's just not getting it. And, and, and the peers can talk to each other and community is a huge part of recovery, it's a huge part. As a matter of fact, I, my personal belief is you, if you have, if you have a moderate to severe substance use disorder, you can't get in recovery without community. If you're on the, if you're on the mild spectrum, you might be able to kick it, but if you're way up there, you've got to have community. Yeah. I, uh, Judge Stoners in my court, we have at least three paid employees that are graduates from our programs. And, um, you know, when I introduced Shannon to my, my 
report and say, she graduated from here five years ago. And she also has a peer support group every Tuesday at the Diversion Hub. And my people, they also get a punch on their incentive card if they go to her peer support. But they relate to her much better than they relate to most people that are trying to just tell them what they need to be doing. But let me also, just from my observation, because I mentioned that I was at Trunk or Treat last night at Remerge, and so was Judge Stoner. Uh, he was not dressed in a costume, however. Um, but you you see, and I, I and I I'm a very close friend of of these judges, but also there was another judge who started with the Remerge program, Jerry Bass, and he's now retired. But um, he got me involved, and I have nothing to do with criminal law, particularly. I was on the civil bench in Oklahoma County, and I do civil, uh, although we also do juvenile deprived and terminations and some other things that sort of cross over a little bit. But um, when you see the people in the community who so appreciate these human beings right here, um, I mean, everybody last night wanted to come up and talk to Judge Stoner. Everybody, you know, he was introducing everybody to everybody. Um, this is such a, a, by the way, I won the trophy for the best trunk. There you go. I think it was a lifetime achievement. But um, I am like, an, I'm not a nonprofit. I'm just me. I just feel like people need to see all of us doing things that are just selfless, right? I mean, that's just the way I approach life. But I see that in these professionals and the legal side, not the medical side, they have taken all these hours and days and weeks and months and years to learn this stuff, um, not through medical courses, but through medical courses that they've, they've also, you know, observed all kinds of other information out there. Um, but people do respond. They really, really respond in this community to their, their leaders. It's not their peers, but their leaders, and the leadership is so critical. And I think that's what we were talking about um, on this side of the of the bench a few minutes ago. So I think that's another message that that we have heard today: community and and support. And it's it's all of our problem, but it's also the leadership. There's something about humans. I you know we have this innate intelligence. It's like a little radar that you can just tell if somebody cares about you or not. And so mm -hmm. you've got to figure out how you can get invested in them. Um, we also have this weird intelligence where I, I don't, I don't really understand how that's happened, but I promise you, you could take a hundred people, put them in a room and you put two heroin addicts in that room. They will find each other in five minutes. They will. They just somehow, they kind of, you know, they kind of have this like radars going on. And, but the same thing with people in recovery, you got to find other people in recovery. If you go back to, if you don't, because if, if you don't have friends in recovery, you're going to go back to the person that's the hair. That, yeah. So, you know, you, you got to figure out who you're going to spend time with because we're social creatures. That's a big part of it. Other questions, comments? Yes. We have a question for some of This one from the county of Hales. Um, how do we address the unwillingness of attorneys to utilize our treatment programs? The obstruction can come from both prosecutors, both the prosecution and the defense, but we can handle many more participants than we uh, get in our programs? It's a great question. Um, a lot of lawyers will advise their clients not to go into a treatment court because it's hard and it's long. And um, there used to be a lot more offering them less time. Oh, you can have two to do, but if you want drug court and you fail, it's a 10 to do. Is it? I thought it was on. Um, which hopefully most um, DA's office are changing that because it's it's just not a good way to, to do things. But um, again, that goes back to all lawyers who practice. I mean, you have to, especially when it comes to the treatment courts and thinking about, okay, it may take you a little longer to get your client into a treatment court because you need to sell the DA on it but it's worth it rather than just walking in and pleading the case to the first offer or second offer, but insisting that they get um, evaluated. And I mean, we try to take some of that out by having them evaluated in the jail early on anyway. Um, but um, yeah. I, I have some strong feelings about this. I think these are people that are not professionals. I mean, they're professionals in the way they have the title, but but if you're really committed to your profession, 
you're spending the time to try to understand the layers and the nuance of it. And, and, but sometimes, you know, you, you know, you get to where you got and you're like, well, that works. So why do you learn anything new? You know, maybe that was the way we practice law for a long time. I was part of it. Um, and, but if you're not, you're not evolving, if you're not trying to challenge yourself with new information or look at things with fresh eyes every once in a while, it gets stuck. The other thing, like what Judge Bird was saying, I've watched lawyers have this conversation. They go, well, listen, you know, you got three to do, or you can do this treatment court. If you got three to do at DOC, you'll probably be in and out, you know, in a year. You only about a year to do. If you do this treatment court, it's a year and a half. You're probably not going to make it anyway. You got to get sober. So you got to probably just do your three. I mean, they'll literally have that conversation. So somebody who's a lawyer, are they looking out for their short-term interests or their long-term interests? Usually a criminal defense attorney, you're measured by how you reduce consequences for your client. So if you can get your client out with no consequences, high five, you did better than anybody else. But ethically, is that really the right thing to do? Because if you don't address the underlying issue that got in the courthouse to begin with, they're just coming back. You know, and so sometimes lawyers are, I think they're setting their clients up in a, in a way. I don't think they're doing it consciously, but, you know, they'll say, well, let's get you, you know, you'll get, get this. And they don't, they, they feel like they've done a better job because I got you out of treatment. I didn't, you didn't have to go to that treatment part of it. And they're literally, because that's what clients will sometimes pay their lawyer to do, get me out of these consequences in some ways. And so lawyers that have a different view in terms of their ethical responsibilities to, Look out not just for the short term interests of their client. I'm going to have fewer responsibilities, but their long term interests of their clients, and really trying to use persuasion to say, look, you know, this is might be a little harder path. The drug courts, I, I believe, this harder than prison. I mean, it's a rigorous accountability, and it's a lot. You, you got to change. <laughs> you got to get sober. Uh, it's a lot of work, um, but it's better for them. And so, but that's a kind of, you know, we got other lawyers here. If that's that, that's what I see, we also need to make them treat. My, my mental health court is, is inexpensive for my people, but for his people, it's expensive. And we need to make the costs a lot lower so that because, you know, spending one to $300 a month scares a lot of people off because they're not thinking about how much money they were spending to support yeah. the addiction and that they probably are going to save money. But we also, I mean, we need to make them not cost prohibitive. Um, of course, sir. Uh, well, to make two comments, uh, one is uh, more uh, education for lawyers and to start in law school uh, would be terrific uh, because most lawyers don't know about these opportunities. And we come across this scenario of, uh, which is almost like lawyers versus doctors when it comes to mental health civil commitments patients having to stay in the hospital and uh, having gone a little bit to law school as a forensic trainee, uh, lawyers do think uh, uh, shorter and freedom and out the door is better because that's what their thinking and philosophy for so many centuries has been about and explaining uh, that somebody can go there, uh, invest time, but it betters them and it helps their life it helps them not uh, to reoffend is a different uh, way and a style of thinking uh, that I think will penetrate more and more uh, in the law as well. We had a question over here. That'll be our last question. Is a uh, is we would do an extensive psychological profile. 70 to 80% of the patients that were consulted for ablative pain procedures were victims of abuse, either physical or sexual. Have you found a similar kind of uh, correlation between people who take drugs and uh, abuse during childhood? Absolutely. Common denominator. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those. I, I'd say probably the most common is, you know, for her court it is a, a diagnosed mental health condition. You, you know, high, high addiction. It's generally high aces. Lots of aces. I ever child experiences, which could be sexual abuse, physical abuse. Growing up in a very high stress environment as a, as a as a child, so your 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 nervous system have been overwhelmed, and you don't really know how to deal with that. And so you they they kind of develop a you know, they're, they're just not quite I, like, like for me, uh, I, it's, 
it's inherently enjoyable for me to sit on my back porch, drink a cup of coffee and watch my dog play in the yard. People that have had a lot of trauma and you sit in there, they're just, they just, they can't quite get comfortable in their own skin. They can't just quite just sit and be. And because they've got, this is my view on this. They've got a lot of disrupted neurological development architecture of their brains a little different because of high trauma throughout childhood, maybe even in adulthood. Um, and they have to involve themselves in a lot of self-soothing type behaviors, um, eating healthy food, smoking cigarettes, doing drugs. They're trying to figure out how to help themselves. That's a normal human aspiration to want to feel normal. I mean, they just want to feel normal. It's what they're usually going for. Um, they don't always think about it in that way. You know, I, I can see it, but, um, and we, we would probably disagree about the best way to get to feeling normal, uh, but that's what is in their environment. And that's what their parents did. And that's also because it's also cultural in so many ways, because, you know, if you just grow up and everybody that, you know, did methamphetamine or did opiates. And so it, it, a lot of our, a lot of our people, I won't say all of them, but I'd say at least half of them, this is not a process of rehabilitation. It's habilitation. They've never ever had stability the, the, you look at the environment they grew up in it's very unstable and they've come from generational you know dysfunction Go ahead. um just a couple examples when i started the remerge program in oklahoma county 10 probably 10 years ago 10 11 years ago and it's for women with children where your rights haven't been terminated and you're involved in the criminal justice system and um you know first five women that came in and one of the women she is raising a child where her father is the father of the child and i thought oh my i mean obviously oh my god um but then you know more women that we were pleading into that program they were victims of the same thing and you just you just I mean, you just look at them and you just go, dear God in heaven, no wonder you are where you are, um, because this is what you were taught at such a young age. And when I started the veterans programs, I'm going to tell you 98% of the women that I pled into or we put into the vets program when I was doing the vets program um, were victims of uh, military sexual trauma. And it it was overwhelming to me because that's a hard, I mean, that's just hard to accept. Um, but it's just, it is what it is. And you again, go, no wonder you're here and you know, you have so many issues and you need help. And so, um, yes, absolutely. It's, it's the norm in so many of their lives. All right. Uh, well, but on a happy note, there is change possible. Thank you, panel. <laughs>